Hello, friends. Today's episode is sponsored by Podcorn. Like many new podcasters, when we first launched Locations Unknown, we had no idea if people would listen to the show. Once we started gaining traction, we had no idea how to attract sponsors to our show. That's when we discovered Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters like us to amazing sponsorship opportunities, such as host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. Podcorn takes the guesswork out of monetizing our show, allowing us to focus more time on content and less time on hunting for sponsors. There's no middlemen, and podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on their platform. They can set their own rates and then collaborate with brands directly. Podcorn's mission is to give podcasters transparency, creative freedom, and full control over how they monetize. You never have to give up rights to your podcast, and Podcorn has dedicated staff to help you along every step of the way. If you are looking to monetize a show just like ours, head over to Podcorn at Podcorn.com. Thank you, Podcorn, and I would like to also thank the Ruck Up Podcast. As a former firefighter EMT myself, I was excited that Joel reached out to sponsor our show. Joel is the host of the Ruck Up Podcast. Ruck Up is geared towards military, law enforcement, security professionals, and outdoor enthusiasts all over the world. Joel talks with fantastic people in some of the most dangerous jobs out there and finds out what makes them tick. Ruck Up Podcast also helps support vets through DV Radio and child rescue initiatives that help children around the world escape slavery. Ruck Up's goal is to educate the masses on safety and protection. Check out the Ruck Up Podcast at www.ruckupmedia.com or search Ruck Up Podcast on your favorite podcast app. Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm Joe Arado, and with me, as always, is a guy who always chews with his mouth closed, Mike Vandebogart. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, and how's it going to our loyal listeners? Uh, this week, we'd like to give a shout-out to Beckett and Keaton Phil. They've been loyal fans of the podcast since we first started, and their whole family has gotten some of our swag in the past. And they've done something really cool. They've actually visited and taken pictures of some of the sites we've talked about and sent us those pictures. So head over to our Facebook page to check some of that out. And uh, just once again, thank you to the entire Thill family for your continued support of our show. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. America, a melting pot filled with diverse cultures, beautiful natural wonders, and a historic sense of exploration. Among the vast beauty of our wilderness, there also lies a more sinister side. Throughout the ages, a haunting collection of nightmares and tales of the unexplainable have been passed down generation to generation. Stories of bloodthirsty creatures lurking in the dark strange lights in the night sky, and vengeful ghouls forever cursed to wander haunted forests. These are the stories that give us pause while hiking in remote areas of the country and fill our heads with dread before falling asleep. Join us this week as we explore some of the creepiest urban legends from across America. Our series begins in the state of Utah, where visitors to this forest would sometimes take souvenirs. 
taking home with them unforeseen consequences and hardship. This is the legend of the curse of the Escalante Petrified Forest. Before we get into all these, Mike's going to be reading all of the, the legends, and my role will be doing the interesting facts from some of the states. So we kind of did that in one of the episodes. We got a lot of uh, positive feedback about that. So we have three different states we're going to cover. I'm going to do some fun facts, and then Mike will get into the urban legends. Now, Mike, did you did you look through any of these facts, or are they going to be new to you? Uh, these are new to me. I, I mean, I may know some of them because I know a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I haven't looked through uh, any of the facts, so I'm excited to hear those. And Perfect. I know, I know people that have been listening to us for weeks. I've been talking about doing this episode, so I'm really excited to do this. Yes. These are some creepy stories. Yes, they're very good. And I, I just <laughs> yeah. love urban legends because you try and imagine what happen to create some of them because some are nutty but uh um, yeah, yeah some are absolutely terrifying yeah and some of them don't really have a clear you know clearly defined origin story it's probably kind of like the telephone game like something happened and it over time just morphed into this crazy story sure <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, let's hear inadvertently some through the series of doing every state over time, like link it back to one just crazy cat lady, like from yeah. 70 years ago. <laughs> just, right. <laughs> All, All right. right. So, yeah, let's get into some of these crazy facts about Utah. All right. So in Utah, it is illegal to hire a trombone player to play on the street to advertise an auction. <laughs> It's a very specific, it's very specific. Uh, law. Additionally, it's illegal to fish while on horseback, and you cannot hunt whales. So, huh, so I didn't know Utah had whales. I, as I say, for those who are not too astute with geography, Utah is landlocked because it's kind of... <laughs> the, <laughs> the Maybe they mean uh, like whales in a zoo or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's, uh, a, that's an interesting one. Yes. In Salt Lake City... It is illegal to walk down the street carrying a paper bag containing a violin. Huh. <laughs> Another uh, very specific. It's like something some long time ago happened where a yep. guy did something with a violin in a bag. And ever since then. Yes. So. <laughs> all right. Um, let me grab another fun one here. Uh, yeah, we don't have to do all. Of I'm them. not going to do all of them. I just looked thread okay. through. I'm going to do the ones that aren't super boring because I thought that I like read through a bunch. I'm like, oh, that's neat. Oh, that's neat. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> now it piles up. I'm like, OK, that's too much. Uh, we'll talk about the proper way to uh, describe someone from Utah. According to Webster's, Utahans is the grammatically correct way to refer to the residents of Utah. However, most people from Utah stubbornly refer to themselves as Utahns. <laughs> I've never really thought about the you know what's the grammatically correct Neither way to I. call someone from Utah. So I learned something right there. <laughs> yes. All right. I'll do two more. Uh, this is from 2012, so I don't know if it's changed, but it was still on the state's fun facts page because maybe it was the last time this happened. Uh, a 2012 Gallup poll found that Utah overall was the best state to live in. So they got I, they I got mean, get I, that I would, for them, going for them. So that's I nice. would love to. I'd love to live there with all the hiking. Yes. So yeah, Zion was uh, awesome there. So that was fun. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, Utah has the highest consumption of Jello in the United States. In fact, Jello is Utah's state snack. Huh. Is there I never something was with a fan of Jello? As you say, is there something <laughs> with Mormons and Jello? There might be. I don't know. Like they I'm can't not a fan drink, so like to like ease their woes, they just eat Jello until they pass <laughs> out or something. <laughs> Oh, that's gross. I like Jell-O, um, so I would I would be down for that. Well, we're going to jump right into this first uh, urban legend. And this one reminded me of the movie uh, Final Destination, if anyone's seen it. Not really in the sense, if you've seen the movie, the plot of it is basically all these people were supposed to die in an accident, and they didn't. And then throughout the movie, they slowly start dying in strange ways. Uh, kind of, you know, like set the 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 world correct again but uh so this story is called the it takes place in the escalante petrified forest state park so i've i've never been there and i don't think you have either joe no i have not but it is a state park in utah it's about a half a mile north of the town of escalante the petrified forest area was actually designated a national monument on december 8th 1906 so it's a it's a pretty old national park i guess you could a national monument 
the Painted Desert was later added, and on December 9th, 1962, the whole monument received national park status, and today the park covers about 93,000 acres, so pretty pretty big state park. It looks really cool, so this is a really, really old region of Utah. They state, they state that over 200 million years ago, large trees and rich vegetation flourished in northeast Arizona, and it was actually a tropical wetland, which... If you've been to Arizona, you know, recently, it's hard to believe that that used to be a tropical wetland. Maybe that's the whale hunting. That's that's what it's from. The, the yeah, law is two million years old. <laughs> so the story of the petrified forest is pretty cool. It's over 200 million years old for people that live internationally. Arizona is a very dry, hot desert region of the United States. <laughs> uh, definitely not tropical. So back 200 million years ago when all of this vegetation was around during heavy rainstorms, uh, trees and other things would flow downstream into Utah. And uh, later on, a a volcano must have destroyed the whole forest area. And then all of the remains of these trees and vegetation, um, you know, kind of sunk into the sediment and mixed in with all the volcanic ash and mud and water. And slowly over those 200 million years, the trees transitioned to stone by a process called, I'm going to butcher this, folks, so uh, you don't have to email me and tell me I'd, I butchered it, but uh, per mineralization, um, it's a process of fossil, fossilization uh, in which organic materials are replaced with minerals such as quartz, making a cast of the original organism. So... Flash forward, you know, to millions of years later, and now we have petrified logs. I think you pronounced it perfectly. <laughs> I think I did somehow. I, th- I, f- I feel like it's a mix of permanent mineraliz- mineralization. So it's permanent. Yeah. <laughs> See, I can't say it now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the park is littered with these giant, basically fossilized trees and they're they're kind of multicolored. They're red and yellow and white and black. They're very prized by you know hobbyists and tourists. And it by the way, it is it's illegal to take this stuff out of the park. So if you ever go there, you, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to leave everything the way it is. That is the story of Escalante, and the legend <laughs> is. Uh, par- it's a particularly troubling legend for tourists and people that visit the park. So what's happened over time, and they actually have a visitor center where they, they kind of post letters from people. Um, so p- tourists go so to the this park. this is not, I'd say, propagated by the park, but it is not refuted either. It's not refuted, and um, this is purely driven by people that have visited the park. Uh, so people visit the park, and they take home a piece of one of these petrified trees. And that's when all the fun starts happening. So, um, (laughs) so basically with a very shocking regularity, visitors who have stolen chunks of petrified wood from Escalante petrified, uh, state park will mail back their lifted souvenirs, usually with a letter of all of the terrible things that have happened to them. Incidents include broke. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Things that have happened to people include uh, broken collarbones, arms, ribs, mysterious illnesses, horrific accidents, and financial ruin. So, yeah, don't take the petrified wood. That would be my first uh, (laughs) suggestion. Um, And the one thing that all of these stories have in common is they've all occurred after a tourist illegally stole a piece of the, the petrified wood. It's kind of it, like I said. It reminds me of the movie Final Destination in a weird way. I wonder if um, in like 2007, all a bunch of bank executives went there and took some petrified wood, and then all of a <laughs> right. sudden we have the subprime mortgage <laughs> meltdown. The the beautiful thing, yeah, right. The the crazy kidding, thing Mike. about this, I know, but are you? <laughs> <laughs> you went silent too long. Like you're thinking about it. Like wait, did they? <laughs> wait, did they? No. Um, so. The the legend didn't really have a, a starting point. It, it, a lot of the stories I read that said many people have and still do mail back cursed pieces of the petrified wood, and the park officials display these letters in a display in the visitor center. So if you ever go to this park, you there's a whole section of the visitor center with letters from 
decades and decades ago. Um, I think the first reported case of bad luck goes back to the 1930s. So it it's very there. No one's sure on how it got started, but it, it you know someone must have. It could have been coincidence or, but the first letter dates back pretty far. So sure, and a lot of people they go, is it you know are people burdened with the moral consequence of taking something out of a park or is it just coincidence? No one really knows, but that, you know, there's a lot of shocking things that have happened to people. Sure. They're thinking like the power of the mind over the body type of deal. Yeah. Like where you can, you can physically change your state with mental thought type deal. So if you are nervous about a curse, you will start exhibiting symptoms of curse. Yeah. And Joe, I've got a bunch of actual letters from people here that I can read to you. Yes, please do. (laughs) There's a lot of news articles out there about this this urban legend, uh, and but these letters are real, and now we can't verify. You know who knows? Obviously, if they're connected to the petrified wood, but they're real, meaning they, that they're letters that the park has posted. Yeah, uh, they've le- letters that the park have, has received along with the piece of stolen wood being sent back. Okay, so um, the, the according to the park man manager Kendall uh, Farnsworth. Um, the person states guilt ridden former visitors often send chunks of petrified wood back to the park, apologizing for having stole it years before it happens about a half a dozen to a dozen times a year. Uh, so basically they're sending it back and they're trying to rid themselves of the curse. That's actually uh, fairly significant. Yeah. Dozen times it, a year, half a dozen, dozen times dozen. a year. And if you read some of what it, these people talk about, it's, it's pretty shocking stuff. So our, our first letter reads, I picked up this small piece of wood when I visited last year. I thought the warnings were phony. Since that time, I've had three accidents. The letter goes on to describe a series of accidents, injuries, and misfortunes, including a broken collarbone, three broken ribs, and a broken foot, not to mention a fire in his motorhome, and the fact that the engine in his car went south shortly after the warranty expired, (laughs) all of which the writer (laughs) believes was payback for defying the curse. The writer finally uh, ends the letter by saying, I'm a true believer. Please take this back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that first guy had a lot of really bad stuff happen to yeah. him. Uh, kind of relatively recently after taking uh, taking that wood. So uh, second letter comes from a guy that is from Switzerland. So the, the letter reads, since my travel there three years ago, I had no good luck in my life, but every year an accident or a disease. (laughs) I hope with this act of restitution, the Lord will have mercy upon me. I apologize and beg your pardon. Sorry. (laughs) So, so apparently this guy stole a piece of wood and every year since he's had an accident or some kind of disease. So I would love to uh, know if it all stopped after they sent it back. Right. Like if they ever reach out to these people or if they just send it back anonymously. <laughs> so uh, I'll just read. Uh, there's one really funny one here. Uh, I'm trying to find it. Uh, oh, this the one letter wrote, take these miserable rocks and put them back. They have caused pure havoc in my love life. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, <laughs> All right, Joe. So here's one final letter I'll read. Uh, It's a little bit longer. Um, It writes, when we were there, we read the letters of the many people who had returned wood to you with tales of bad luck, ruined marriages, as well as other stories of misfortune. At first, we did not believe the ramblings of such superstitious people. But upon further review of the life and lack of luck that our family members have had the past 30 years, we have begun to wonder if possibly the legend could have some truth to it. So uh, just imagine since 1930, they've gotten a dozen, dozen of these letters every year. So I think uh, I think the curse is true. You think it's true? I was going to say there's definitely yeah. something there uh, when you have that many people and whether it is a mind over matter type thing. Yeah. End, of the, end, of this, end of the day, there's people visiting Escalante yeah. They're taking petrified wood, and they shouldn't. And as a result, yep. they're having very unfortunate circumstances happen to them until they send that back. 
I think this goes into our broader thing that we say every episode is leave no trace. Yes. That, <laughs> Just yeah. That also that also means don't take stuff out of the parks. Uh, it's there for everyone to enjoy. So what's like the Pinterest you, saying? You know, <laughs> I, leave, I don't know it. Take nothing but photographs. Leave nothing but footprints. There you go. <laughs> and foot, it, it, only on the trails. There's yeah, only on the trails. They've got yes. some yeah, protected areas. So. Yeah, not on endangered um, ferns or mosses. <laughs> So yeah, that's our first urban legend. It's a pretty pretty crazy one. So uh, if you ever I'm, visit, I'm going to say I'm going to vote. Let's do the MythBusters. I'm going to vote plausible. I'll vote plausible too. I'm going to vote plausible. <laughs> and, and plausible meaning, I don't necessarily believe in curses, but I believe in the a human being's ability to tell to what's the way to say it? A human being's ability to convince themselves of predetermined thoughts or notions that affect your physical nature or being. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I guess you know people, these people probably would have had bad stuff happen to them anyways. But they're, you know, they feel bad about taking something out of the park, and they know of this curse, so they're gonna. Yeah. I mean, that one dude just wanted to spruce up his motorhome, and <laughs> <laughs> it just started on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a sign. I don't know what is. <laughs> you know what it kind of reminds me of. Um, oh, it was a movie a few years ago. Do you remember the movie where um, they it was actually a really cool twist on the moon landing where the moon rocks were actual like alien species? I've not seen that. And it was supposed to be kind of like a Blair Witch Project. It's actually really cool, but it wasn't really popular. And it was playing off like in the real world. We know how many moon rocks have been brought back to the yeah. earth and like they've been given out to dignitaries and whatever. And there's a ton of them just randomly missing and unaccounted for. And basically it was these moon rocks were actually like a species and they like had legs and would move around and like poison people and stuff. <laughs> wow. But like they would never move when you're looking at them type thing. Huh. So I wonder, we'll if, to... I wonder if these petrified wood, like when they leave your house, they'll just like send a loved one a really nasty text message and then delete it. And then you're in trouble. And <laughs> Kind of like that animated movie a few years ago, Sausage Party, where the the grocery store came to life when everyone left. <laughs> Such a weird, <laughs> terrible movie. Oh, man. All right. Well, before we get to our next story, we would again like to thank our show sponsor, Podcorn. If you are looking to monetize your podcast and have no idea where to go, check out Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters like you with real sponsors to start making that sweet, sweet coin on your show. With Podcorn, there is no middleman. Podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform. You set your own rates and collaborate with brands directly without exclusivities. Podcorn helped us monetize Locations Unknown, and we know they can help you too. Check out the marketplace at podcorn.com. Our next le- urban legend brings us to West Virginia, where the stories of human-like creatures have terrified many since the 60s. These encounters and stories have even inspired a horror book and a film starring Richard Gere. This is the legend of the Mothman. Now, I'm excited to learn about this one. I'm going to do, again, a couple of facts of West Virginia, but um, I, I actually have not seen the movie read the book, or knew anything about Mothman. So I'm pretty excited about that. The only thing I knew about Mothman was um, there was an X-Files episode where Mothman may have made an appearance. I don't know that they called. They made reference to Mothman. I vaguely remember that one. I haven't watched the full X-Files series in many years. Now I'm going to go download them all. Yeah, it was like season three or five. Oh, wow. One of the seasons from the 90s, so a while ago. (laughs) I'm like going to take a note to just download all the X-Files, X-Files seasons and uh, just binge those. Yeah, it's a good show. <laughs> all right. So West Virginia is considered the southernmost northern state. And guess what? It's the northernmost southern state. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to, way to categorize it. <laughs> it could also be a thing that's just like they don't have any other fun facts. So they're just like, you know, we're going to do this. Uh, here's a negative fun fact. West Virginia was the first state to implement sales tax in the United States on July Ooh. 1st, 1921. <laughs> Frickin' three days before Independence Day, jerks. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there's that. There's that. 
Uh, the first federal prison exclusively for women in the United States was opened in 1926 in West Virginia. Mm. And let's see here. Oh, nearly 75% of West Virginia is covered by forests, which I believe because it is gorgeous, actually, of a state to visit. It is a cool state. I, I've driven through it a few times. Uh, it's a lot of fun to drive through. It's very hilly and yes. mountainous. and yeah, That's a, a great way to put it. It is a fun state to drive through. Like, we're in Wisconsin. If you have to drive to, like, Minnesota, that means you have to go through, like, the middle of the state, but not the yeah. quick way, <laughs> like, <laughs> on an angle. And it's just yeah. not fun to look at. Yeah, West Virginia is a cool state. I, I've stopped through a few times, and, yeah, it's a cool state. All right, I'll do a few more. This one's actually kind of neat. West Virginia is credited with the beginning of outdoor advertising. It uh, Its origin was in Wheeling in 1908 when the Block Brothers Tobacco Company painted bridges and barns with the wording, treat yourself to the best chew mail pouch. <laughs> oh, that would be so not politically correct. I know. Now. <laughs> Just, they're probably giving free samples to children. Hey, young man, are you playing baseball? You can't pitch the ball oh, without a great. pack of chew in the mouth. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Mother's Day originated in 1908 in a church in uh, Grafton, West Virginia, in Andrews Church. And then here's a fun law. A person may not hold public office if he or she has ever participated in a duel. <laughs> And the la- uh, I'll do the last two because these are both funny. Whistling okay. underwater is prohibited. I didn't know you could even do that. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't think you could. And then this one's very specific to one city, which this is, again, one of those, I call them Bob's Laws. Like yeah. <laughs> so, some idiot did this thing and then they had to make a law. In the city of Alderson, one may not walk a lion, tiger, or leopard, even if it's on a leash. <laughs> That is a, that's a pretty impressive if you could walk all three of those. Um, well, it's a, you I, know, it's Bob was walking down the street and they tried arresting him and he's like, but it's on a leash. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, that was uh, fun. Teach me about Mothman. Okay. So uh, the, the Mothman really originated back in 1966. So there was... Uh, there was a newspaper headline that, and it, it's a pretty funny headline. It says, couples see man-sized bird creature something. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that's verbatim? Yeah. Couples so, see man-sized bird creature something. Creature something. <laughs> so, um, so the first sighting was in 1966, and... Uh, from there, the the myth of Mothman exploded. Residents all over West Virginia throughout the decades have reported seeing a winged, human-like, red-eyed creature around the state. And a lot of people are unsure if it was a demon, alien, or genetic sp- experiment gone wrong. So It's got to be uh, one of those three. <laughs> Wait, hold on. This is just hitting me. 1966. Not yeah. 1866. 1966. So, so uh, like pretty like, recent. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. And get this. Um, as recently as 2016, there was a Mothman sighting. And this was in an actual news report. I think it was like an ABC station. And the guy actually got photographs of it. Um, Are you serious? Of course, yeah. No, they, they go out. You can. We'll, we'll post the photographs on our Facebook page after the episode. But of course, like every UFO video, it's grainy and. You, you can't really see anything, but it supposedly it's a picture of Mothman. And interestingly, uh, I, during my research, I came across uh, in 2017, f- reportedly 55 people in Chicago uh, claim to have seen Mothman. So he is not only in West Virginia, but apparently in Chicago. Or he was so, just taking a vacation. <laughs> so um, like Joe mentioned, the, the, the myth has spawned. Um, several you know pieces of popular culture uh the the novel came out a horror novel came out in 1975 and um i checked amazon it's a pretty popular book and then the richard gear movie came out in 2002 which is called the mothman prophecies um 
didn't get as good reviews. Uh, I think IMDb had it as a 6.4, so not terrible, but not great. Um, so if you have any interest in Mothman, you might want to check out the book or the movie. In Point Pleasant, where the original incident was recorded, there's actually a Mothman museum, a Mothman festival, and a like life-sized statue of Mothman. So uh, the people of Point Pleasant have really you know, embraced the, the legend of Mothman, and um, it's even become big business for some of the local uh, shop owners there. Some people believe that Mothman is a bad omen, only appearing when catastrophe is about to strike. Uh, there have been many claims of the winged, red-eyed creature uh, right before uh, the Point Pleasant Silver Bridge collapsed in 1967. So, you know, some people think this is more of a deeper meaning that something terrible is about to happen if you see the Mothman. A folk folklorist, uh, Jan... So Herald. they're thinking this is like more prof- prophetic, like yeah, wow, yeah. So, uh, it's so it, there's a lot of here. yeah, there's a lot of different theories on Mothman. Uh, some people uh, believe that um, the sightings are connected with UFOs or maybe even some type of military project. So there's a lot of military bases uh, in that part of the country. Another guy even states that. He, he's a little skeptical skeptical. He says there's a lot of hoaxes that followed uh, the Mothman sightings. You know, people, you know, tr- construct a uh, healing balloon, all kinds of weird stuff to try to fake the Mothman. So, um, you know, there's a lot of there's even some uh, pseudoscience adherents, probably people you'd see on like ancient aliens um, <laughs> claim that Mothman is an alien or a supernatural manifestation or some previously unknown species of animals. So it's it's been a wide, widely covered legend throughout the last couple of decades. And uh, we actually, I have a lot of notes from the original uh, newspaper article of the first encounter of Mothman. So this, is, so this is the origin story of Mothman. This is the origin story of Mothman. So Fantastic. The, article, the article starts out with a quote. The, the people that saw it go, it was a bird or something. It definitely wasn't a flying saucer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the the point the two point pleasant couples said that they encountered a man sized bird like creature in the TNT area about midnight last night. This is now, mind you, this is the article from 1966. Uh, it goes on to say, sheriff deputies. And city police went to the scene about two o'clock this morning, but were unable to spot anything. Uh, But the two young men telling their story this morning were dead serious and asserted they hadn't been drinking. So, um, you know, you drink enough booze, I guess you you see anything. Um, So um, Steve Millett and Roger Scarberry uh, described a thing as being about six or seven feet tall, having a wingspan of about 10 feet and red eyes about two inches in diameter and six inches apart. So it sounds like a really terrifying thing to see. When did meth in the mountain start becoming a thing? <laughs> I don't, I don't think Just unrelated question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Millet described it. it, it he, he, he is quoted as saying it was like a man with wings it wasn't like anything you'd seen on TV or in a monster movie. Um, so the men and their wives were in Scarberry's car between 11.30 p.m. and midnight when they spotted the creature near the old power plant adjacent to uh, the old National Guard armory building. The okay, we was, got power plant and government structures involved now. Yep, well, and this is a, an abandoned power plant. Oh, we're checking so, off boxes. Yeah, so the creature was seen standing on... Th- three occasions and was described as being extremely fast. It flew about a hundred miles an hour. One of them quoted in flight, but was a clumsy runner. (laughs) Uh, So I love the descriptions of this thing. It, it, it's detailed enough where I, it, they could just be making this up. They saw something or it, (laughs) um, they're on acid, right? (laughs) They said they weren't drinking. Maybe no. they weren't lying, but they also weren't telling the truth. So the uh, the article goes on. It says Deputy 
Millard Halstead said he had seen dust in the vicinity of a coal field, but it could have could have been caused by a bird. He said, "He goes, I'm a hard guy to scare, but last night I was getting, I was for getting out of there." So this guy in the article states how you know he's he's a tough guy, but he was even kind of getting creeped out by being up where they they thought they saw it. Yeah, he just felt um, uneasy there. Yeah, so they write uh, the article goes on. It goes. Uh, they did just that, but the thing followed them. They said it was hovering, um, it was hovering above the car, apparently gliding until they reached the National Guard Armory on Route 62. It goes on to state, and they're quoted now saying, "We went downtown, turned around, and went back, and there it was again. It seemed to be waiting for us." He said, "The light gray, like creature, then scurried through a field. It also had flown across the top of his car." So. They describe it as, you know, kind of following them in their car and then like waiting for them. So pretty creepy encounters. Um, they also go on. I think this is probably where they get the the Mothman name. They they said it's afraid of light. Um, so, you know, like but are a moth... moths attracted to light. Yeah, they are attracted to light. So maybe that's not why it's called Mothman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I take that back. <laughs> um, they. uh the the young men said they they saw into the creature's eyes, which glowed red only when their lights shined on it, and it seemed to want to get away from the lights. So, um, oh, so terif- Mothman's got cataracts. <laughs> yeah. So it's a it's a terrifying creature, and uh, you know the article goes on to kind of describe some more of the the scene, but you get the gist of it, kind of. And so, as I said, there's been sightings of it throughout the decades. Now, flash forward to 2016. So WCHS 8, which is an ABC station out there, actually ran a article, a, ran a, you know, an investigative report on this because uh, this is the guy who took pictures of it. So uh, in the news article, it, it states there hadn't been any recent sightings of the red eyed creature recently, but that changed Sunday evening when a man who says he was driving along State Route 2 saw something jump from tree to tree. He pulled off the road and snapped some pictures. In the pictures, the creature appears to have wings with pointed tips, long legs, bent at an awkward ankle. Angle. So um, this guy actually was able to get pictures, which is, is pretty cool. Um, so Point Pleasant locals, such as Carolyn Harris, believe the pictures could be real because there have been so many other sightings over the years you know, locals really think this thing is real. It's kind yeah. of, you know, in those areas of the country where people see Bigfoot all the time, okay. people that live there really think, you know, Bigfoot's real. Man, they got to deal with Bigfoot and Mothman. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a, it's a cool story. And there's, those are just, that was the original sighting and then the one sighting where there were pictures taken. But if you Google Mothman, there's a lot of articles out there about sightings and, um, it's, uh, it sounds like a terrifying creature and you wouldn't want to come across it at night, but yeah. So Mike, I was just looking at the video. So I, yeah. I think cause a, a, you mentioned it before, Mike, because of copyright, we're probably not going to play the audio directly on here, but yeah. go look we'll at the video. Yeah. We'll link to yeah. it, but go look at the video and then look at some of the comments. There's the comments are absolutely hilarious. The That's top the comment part. right now is he's just looking for lamps. <laughs> He's Mothman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I love the internet. I'm so, someone just wrote, he's my boyfriend. <laughs> There's just some ridiculous crap. Yeah, There's like a mix crazy. of the people who get angry at those people. Uh, it's good stuff. But yeah, uh, we'll link to it. Go check it out. The The, the guy telling the story is funny. There's a, a whole statue in the town, like right in the yep. middle of a road. Yeah, so it's uh, the people locally there really believe in it, and they've embraced it as uh, part of their culture. So it's uh, terrifying, but also kind of kind of cool that <laughs> they all can get around this terrifying creature that has red eyes and wings, and so. But all right, on to our final legend of the episode. This one, this one is creepy. I'll let you do the fun facts, but yeah, this one was. Uh, I don't think I ever want to drive down this road. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, so I definitely just I kind of breezed over it, but I didn't want to get too far into it. So I could yeah. have some organic questioning for it. But this is the one that kind of terrified me just because I visit Colorado so much. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, with that, 
Now, I'll, I'll read the intro d- directly, even though we mentioned the state already. Okay. Our last urban legend brings us to Colorado, where a small section of road has been the story of nightmares and incidents for many years. Again, some fun facts. This one's actually kind of funny. I didn't know this one. The University of Colorado named their cafeteria grill after an infamous confessed cannibal, Alfred G. Packer, with his slogan being, have a friend for lunch. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That's insane. He literally means have some of your friend and eat him. Yeah, I know. (laughs) So this one's funny. So Denver Broncos quarterback Peyton Manning bought 21 Papa John's franchises in Colorado before marijuana was legalized. And he credits the law change to his now booming business. That is uh, that is amazing foresight. That is genius. That's what (laughs) that is. is. That's like that. uh, Remember that Girl Scout that went and parked her cookie sale stand right outside of a dispensary? Yeah. And broke geez. like every state record for cookie sales and forced the Girl Scouts <laughs> to make a rule about not doing that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the interviews in the news story for that one are worth seeing, too. We won't link that one, but you guys have Google. You can figure it out. <laughs> uh, on that same on that same uh, thread, mile marker 420 was removed by officials in Colorado and replaced with a. sign because the 420 was stolen so often. (laughs) That is funny. And you know what's funny about that? So (laughs) I have a similar story from when I was growing up. So I I grew up in a small town in southern southern southeastern Wisconsin and I lived on High Street. And we lived on the corner and the sign the high street sign was probably stolen once a year. Yeah. It was stolen. It would take the city like eight months to put a new one in. And then like a week later, it would be stolen again. <laughs> <laughs> so you spent your whole childhood like with a road sign that would only be around for a few weeks at a time. Oh, yeah. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Plot twist. You have about 20 of them. I have like 25 high street signs in my yeah. house. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Yes. <laughs> I was a child. So this one's fun for, uh, I'd say, for both of us as mountaineers. Mount Massive and Mount Elbert in Colorado are so close to each other in height that their supporters started competing with each other. With Mount (laughs) Massive supporters piling stones on the summit to increase its height and Mount Elbert supporters climbing the mountain to knock them back down. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That's like a fun little thing. That's funny. Yeah. Um, this one's kind of a funny uh, sentence. A Colorado judge sent- sentences violators brought to the court for blasting loud music to an hour of listening to Barry Manilow at a high volume. <laughs> <laughs> That's like torture. Yes. <laughs> uh, did you know Denver, Colorado was the only city ever to be awarded an Olympic Games and reject them? I did not know that. Yes. I, I didn't know that either. That was pretty cool. What else here? This one I didn't know either, and I I confused it initially for that guy who like hijacked a tank and like destroyed a city. Remember yeah. that? From yeah, I do. The nineties or whatever. Well, in two thousand six, a man armored a bulldozer with steel plates and concrete, making it a tank basically, and destroyed half of Granby, Colorado. Wow, just went crazy. Huh. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the Colorado State slogan is "Enter a higher state." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I see a theme here with a lot of these. Oh man, it's such there's such like pre-baked innuendo. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and this guy um is probably the coolest and most manly men of uh the show today. The last known grizzly bear in Colorado died when she was attacked by a bow hunter named Ed Weisman. Now, don't get mad at Ed first. You're gonna be like, holy cow. Yeah. Wiseman was playing dead because he was being mauled. And the bear didn't stop mauling him, so he decided to fight back. So he picked up a loose arrow and stabbed the bear in the jugular. Wow. I know. That's insane. I would and have just died probably. <laughs> I feel bad the grizzly bear died, but at the same time, the guy was was being mauled. Yeah, exactly. Like He tried to play dead, which is what you're supposed to do because... Typically, grizzlies are only attacking to eliminate a threat. So if you're no longer a threat, they leave you alone. 
But so like you got to think of it this way too. He was being mauled. Yep. So it's not like he had his full strength. He was being mauled long enough to realize that the mauling wasn't going to stop, was able to get back on his feet or whatever, or find a loose arrow and then stab a bear in the neck to death. (laughs) Well, uh, those are some pretty funny uh, facts about Colorado. And obviously there is a theme to uh, marijuana with a lot of them. Yes. Um, Well, I got to read this last one. I'm sorry. This one was funny. Okay. And then I promise that's it. Okay. Chicken wings, pizza, and many other foods are legally sandwiches in Colorado. <laughs> Just why? Why make a law? Know. Don't they have better I things even to do? Saying it. <laughs> um, oh, I'm gonna go there now. I'm gonna go to a pizza shop and be like, I'm gonna have a cheese sandwich. And they're like, We only have pizzas here. I'm like, yeah, pizzas legally sandwiches. Well, on that note, we're gonna. We're going to make yes, t- take go, it to a more, uh, a more sinister side here. So <laughs> yeah. our final legend of the episode is called Riverdale Road. So uh, if you haven't heard of Riverdale Road, it's 11 horrifying miles near Thornton, Colorado. It's crammed with enough horrifying legends to bring even the bravest paranormal investigator to their knees. It's filled with ghostly runners attacking parked cars on Joggers Hill various demons and even a phantom Camaro revving its engine. Uh, but the, the creepiest thing is a, a spot called the gates of hell, which seems to be the epicenter. Um, the, it, yeah, the physical the, iron, the it, name is, uh, apparently irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The gates of hell. So it used to be an old iron gate, which is gone now, but what remains is the partial shell of an old mansion where a madman supposedly burned his wife and children alive. Left behind, left behind are a barren, charred plot of land and a white-clad woman who supposedly wanders the area. So, pretty, pretty terrifying. So, like it did, area. like the house burnt down, and yeah. they're saying like he burnt the house down with his wife and kids inside. Yeah. Now there's supposedly people see this uh, white-clad ghost woman who wanders the area, which I assume is his wife. Jeez. So really creepy. And it also goes on to say that she's joined by ghost of slaves that were supposedly hanged in that area. So this part of So some people speculate that this has a bad vibe in this area because there used to be a lot of, a lot of really terrible things that happened in the, the distant past with slavery and things like that. So, um, so it's I'll like an right unusually in. sinister or heinous place for yeah. murder, death and murder, death. And even to this awful, day, there's things you'll, uh, as I go on, you'll see why some of these myths, uh, people have these legends here is because of kind of things that happen in on Riverdale road. So, um, it's not really, no one's really sure when some of these legends started, um, as you'll, as you'll see later on, some of these things go back 150, 200 years. So um, really bad things have been happening in the Riverdale Road area since the mid 1800s. Um, and it, you can just assume that, as you know, as these things happen, the stories about them kind of change over time and kind of turn into these legends that we're talking about. Sure. I'm so, sure they evolve a little bit. So within the Riverdale legend, there's like sub legends. <laughs> uh, the first one is a, this ghost jogger that chases cars and people. So the story goes, um, it, they, they state uh, there's been a lot of accidents over the years that happened the joggers on this road. So it's um, there's been a lot of people killed while jogging. And uh, yeah, there's people have been driving their cars late at night and they have claimed to have seen you, you, that some of them claim to have felt like they had hit something and then they get out of their car and there's nothing there. Um, and then off in the distance, they'll see a, like a faint jogger running away down the, you know, down the road. So really creepy. <laughs> yeah. That mess with your head. So that is the, uh, the jogger chasing cars. There's a report. There's a lot of reported demonic activity. So, Apparently there's a lot, there's a large amount of satanic activity going on there. So satanic worshipers, there's a lot of abandoned structures along uh, Riverdale road and there's a lot of graffiti and they find headless animals. And 
sometimes oh, people, wow. yeah, sometimes people claim to hear footsteps in the distance getting closer, like in the woods, but then they never see anybody. So just <laughs> really, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be on this road at night. They, I'm gonna let, well, yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> it's so, like they've like found like what could be the most terrifying version of the thing you don't want to have happen. And it happens in this stretch of road. And like we mentioned earlier, there used to be a lot of uh, slave activity in this area. So people have many people have reported, you know, deep in, like you kind of look off into the woods and they they think they see like a ghost swinging from a tree. And it only happens during a full moon. So even creepier. So that is the the ghost swinging from trees legend. Uh, this one is this one's creepy. Uh, bloody handprints appear on signs. So people will be driving down the road late at night and they'll see a sign on the side of the road with like a bloody child's hand print on it and they freak out and then they they'll go back there in the morning and it's gone. And people report this several times they've seen these handprints on signs and then they come back the next day and it's gone. So uh, there's no history as to why, you know, why that's happening, but just uh, <laughs> really creepy. This one is just strange, the Phantom Camaro. So there was a, back in the 70s, I guess, there was a guy in a Camaro who was flying down Riverdale Road in a Camaro, and he ended up getting a terrible crash and dying. And the legend goes that some nights, if you're late, you're out late on the, the road, you're going to off in the distance, you'll see this ghost Phantom Camaro like revving its engine flying down the road. Um, and you try to get closer to it and you never do. And then it's gone. Um, so r- really strange. There is a, a story of a di- the disappearing hitchhiker. So I'm just pe- wondering what makes this road unique. Cause I'm, I'm thinking there's this like hodunk small town in Colorado yeah. where like, cause it says Thornton, Colorado, Yeah. but I'm looking at a map right now and I zoom out. It's like in Denver. Yeah. It's no, it- like. A it's couple miles f- from the Denver airport. Yeah. It's in the city. Like, I'm thinking of, like, farm road, like... Off in the middle of this nowhere. This is right in the middle of a city. Yeah. The the next legend... I'm going to go there. You, you should. During the day. <laughs> <laughs> During the day. Go at night. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to um, go at night. <laughs> so, the the next myth is called the disappearing hitchhiker. So... People have reported they'll be driving down the road. Yeah, obviously, these all happen at night, late at night. And uh, they'll see a young woman in white who is walking down the road asking to you know, be picked up. And if you pull over, as soon as you go to pick her up, she's gone. There's no sign of her. So, uh, again, really strange kind of maybe there is somebody that was hitchhiking years ago and was mur- murdered or killed on the road and her ghost wanders the road now, but people have claimed to see this. The final myth of Riverdale road that I could find was roaming native American shapeshifters. Apparently hundreds of years ago, obviously this was it. There was some native American land here and people claim to have seen, you know, these native American shapeshifters that will shift, shift in and out of shapes of different things like animals and, they they'll cross the road or you'll see them off in the the woods and they try to communicate pe- with people sometimes and just really creepy and you know all of that just makes me not want to drive down that road ever <laughs> dude i am like of all the urban legends we did today i like this one the most cuz it's terrifying i'm looking at a picture online right now yeah. that somebody took on some turn i'm sure you've seen this yeah cuz it's like one of the first there's like clearly a figure in the middle of the road yeah. Now, granted, they could have staged it, but it doesn't like if it was like a person, I feel like it'd be more clear. Yeah. That's so, nuts. yeah, it, it could be the the jogger, could be the hitchhiker, could be a shapeshifter. Um, but Native yeah. American shapeshifter. So this is one of those places. And, you know, we talked about in the Alaska Triangle episode that there's certain places in the world that seem to have a weird energy about them. <laughs> And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this part of Colorado has got something weird going on that, well, that part where they, they say the gates of hell, like, yeah, 
it's that's another thing I believe in. I know we talked about like the gravitational forces and that type of stuff. Like that's scientifically <laughs> yeah. proven. I do believe like in this. I'd say probably isn't scientifically proven. Um, I'm sure I'll piss some people off who think it is. <laughs> uh, but like areas where just horribly bad things happened or extremely evil people were like yeah. that guy. Um, I haven't researched him. I'm assuming. Yeah. But that can create like the, the palpable like dark energy, if you will. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh, these there's, there's just too many things people are seeing on this road. There's something going on. Who knows what, maybe it's just the imagination of people. They know this road is got a history of being haunted. So people go there wanting to see something. And then, you yeah, know, you're like, all right, let's hit it at one in the morning. Yeah. They just believe... drive up and down for three hours. And <laughs> so if we have any tired, listeners driving at night. Yeah. If we have any listener listeners in Colorado, uh, go take a drive late at night on a full moon and let us know what happens. I'd be curious to hear how no, it no, goes. No, no, for no, no. Don't <laughs> don't do that. But if you do do it, send us pictures and video. But we don't yes. recommend you do that. No. It'd be but, our uh, luck that one of them disappears and be like, their lawyers <laughs> like, you told them to go. You're liable. Um, yeah. But uh, well, uh, that ends the the three legends we had. Um, I think, uh, Joe, this was kind of one of our fun episodes. Uh, anyone who listens normally, this is not like what we not the normal type of episode we do. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 fun to sprinkle in there. Yeah, we uh, these legends are creepy, and we've got a whole ton of them. So we, you'll probably do another episode down the road with some different legends if people like this. If we get a lot of negative feedback where people just think it's terrible. Then we'll probably still do it anyways. Cause yeah. Cause it's fun for us and it's our yeah. show. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, uh, so thanks again for tuning into our show. Uh, we appreciate all of you listening and sharing uh, locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We're also on uh, LinkedIn, Imgur, yep. <laughs> um, pretty much every social media platform you can find us on now. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that you can, can subscribe to. We eventually get our shows up there uh, if you'd rather watch it uh, on YouTube. And if you'd like to support the show, visit our Facebook store and buy some of our cool swag. Otherwise, uh, we have a Patreon account, which you can find in the show notes. Yes, definitely. We appreciate all of our loyal listeners and our sponsors. We got new sponsors. If you guys didn't notice, it's because of you guys. So that helps keeps the show going and uh, really incentivizes us to put out more content and spend more time. So, And remember, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or just taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.